today we're going to talk about shared art and narratives. How can we use creative media and art um, to interpret and disseminate emerging norms in positive cooperative ways instead of polarizing ways? Uh, we have a really fantastic panel. We have uh, Jay McCarthy, who I've already, I think, uh, well, just introduced for a second, but, uh, you know, she's been, I mean, uh, I think Lou's posting all bios, so you can really read up on people, but I, I think rarely have attended such a, um, I think, positive, um, I guess, like launch of a book uh, as that one for Neolife. I uh, welcome you all to check out the book Neolife. It's kind of like a really fantastic very positive and uplifting narratives about the future that there she's holding it up. It's a fantastic book. Um, and we, we probably dive uh, into that a little bit more, but she, uh, she did a, a really great meeting, which I went to with Creon, who you may know, uh, Jane, who knows you and who's yeah, <laughs> told me a lot about you. I'm going to unmute you. I actually, I'm, in fact, I'm going to unmute all the panelists now in case you want to chime in when I say something, unmute and unmute. Um, and great. Uh, and then next one up, um, we have Lydia, I think, is Lydia here? Uh, Lydia, oh yeah, yeah, you're here, I'm going to mute you too. So Lydia has also um, recently started a fantastic project, The New Modality, um, which I think Jane also knew about, and um, it's basically... I was, um, I was a like backup a, person starter. She was, she was one of our... Oh, backers. yes, that's how we met. <laughs> Oh, this is fantastic. Okay, well, then I'm even, even happier to have both of you here today. Um, and yeah, the new modality is kind of like a community, uh, really community focused uh, new medium. And, um, and we had uh, Lydia for um, a salon uh, in the first or second week of the uh, daily online salons of the Sanity Preserver. So maybe Lou can share, uh, oh no, uh, we are probably going to talk a little bit about how the new modality has progressed since then. Um, and hopefully like ways in which people can can contribute because I think what's so interesting about the magazine is that it's a really community run uh, magazine where you actually like ask a lot, uh, a lot of feedback and a lot of contributions from uh, all of us. So let's see whether we can like, uh, whether we can use both of your, um, both of your fantastic outlets as an inspiration to think a little bit bigger in terms of uh, positive uh, narratives that we can come up with. Then we have Jake Hopper here. I, who also real did... quick. I actually just posted the letter from the editor in the table of contents for our first print issue in chat. So if anybody wants to read that, um, it has a list of everything that's going to be in our first print issue, which is going to be printed in the next few weeks and sent to buyers. You can still buy it if you want. Also, you can just read the letter from the editor, the website, and the table of contents. Okay, that's lovely. Jane, do you maybe want to fill us in on how people can and uh, what what made you and uh, what what inspired you to do a neo life and how people can uh, can learn more? Sure, um, I will put the uh, URL there. Um, so it's first of all, it's called neo life, but it's neo dot life because dot life is actually a domain name and an incredibly inspiring one, and so much more inspiring than dot com. <laughs> um, and it's sort of indicative of um, the way I sort of see things. But, you know, essentially after Wired, I got involved in a chocolate factory, um, which got me thinking about <clears throat> chocolate as a sacred plant, as a carrier for, um, for other sacred plants uh, and probiotics and things like that. It also got me thinking about farmers and food systems and um, the way those things are connected to our health. Um, <clears throat> and then suddenly I had three octogenarians uh, that I was responsible for 2,500 miles away, dealing with mental illness and um, cognitive decline. And so I started looking for solutions. And I thought that, um, you know, drugging the ones with mental illness um, was probably not the right solution. And that, um, you know, giving the Alzheimer's drugs uh, to those with cognitive decline offered so little hope. And so I began looking for what the future has in store for us. What is the leading edge of research? What technologies are available? And along the way, I discovered this extraordinary collection of some of the most brilliant people ever um, who have some of the most powerful tools uh, our species have ever encountered. I mean, I'm not necessarily going to put it up there with fire, but um, we do have the opportunity now to transform our species to evolve ourselves and to do so from a genetic basis, but also from a, um, a mental and emotional uh, and spiritual side as well. Um, and so I wanted to 
first of all, just learn. Um, you know, understanding the body, understanding um, how I could be as healthy and um, uh, vital as possible, um, how I could use that information to help my family. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, the bigger picture about how this can transform our society uh, became this just sort of obsession. And, um, you know, when I looked for visions of the future around all of these technologies, you know, it was... 100% negative, um, with the exception of, you know, people like the transhumanists, um, who I think are often really smart to be putting out these positive visions for the future of our species. Um, but I think so many people consider the transhumanist movement to be sort of um, marginal and radical and, you know, all of those things. So, you know, I, I am trying to, um, to do the journalism, to do the science writing, to do the science communicating, um, but at the same time to hook it into how these technologies have the potential to, um, to evolve us all to a place where we all want to be. And so Neolife um, started as a newsletter uh, and we started publishing on the Medium platform, but then that turned out to not be a viable thing for publishers. Um, who wanted to have some kind of a self-sustaining business model. Uh, and so at that point I said, okay, well, we need to start doing things that generate revenue. Uh, and so um, people will buy a book as the Kickstarter campaign so uh, reassuringly uh, demonstrated. Um, you know, they may pay for uh, events to come to events. Uh, and so, you know, this year, the past year has been about exploring ways to create a self-sustaining um, idea, uh, community, um, and, um, and, and mission really of getting people comfortable with the way these technologies are going to transform us. And, you know, I have to say, there's a lot to be very, very uncomfortable about, you know, I mean, with the digital revolution 25, six, seven years ago, you know, we could talk about how whatever's good for the internet is good for humanity. And we really believe that. You know, with the biotechnological revolution, it's entirely possible that there will be things that happen that are not good for humanity. And so what we're trying very deliberately to do is to find those things that matter, those things that show where we could be going in the future, um, to amplify best practices, to identify, you know, the, the guidelines, and ultimately, you know, to have some sense of, you know, what's the right way to do this. So anyway, so this is the book. That's what we're focused on now. Uh, you can get it at www.neo.life. And there are amazing stories about incredibly powerful technologies and extraordinary people uh, and some pretty compelling visions for where we're going. Yeah. And I hope in a second we're going to talk specifically about like, you know, which maybe of those even are relevant to kind of like lift people's uh, kind of like live to Kind of like broaden people's horizons right now um uh, like, that's fantastic and I, I can't wait to dive into the specifics of that uh, lydia uh, you i think mentioned also that you had like a follow-up um oh i was i guess i want to make sure that we get a chance to introduce the other panelists as well but um I was just going to say, I think uh, the vision for the new modality and neolife are actually very aligned, but they don't overlap that much, um which I thought was really cool. Uh, I was actually really inspired by early wired when we were putting together the new modality. It was like one of our big like inspirations was like looking at all these like early nineties copies of the magazine and just being really excited about what it was like. Um, and, uh, I feel like we're both coming out of a community or like a world that has very similar DNA. Um, both of these publications. We actually have an article about transhumanism on the website already for New Modality issue one, and we're going to have an article in in, uh, in the print issue as well. Um, but I feel like Jane has gone much deeper sort of in the specific like biotech direction, which I think is really important. Um, and we're sort of like on this broader zeitgeist, which covers a, a, a much like wider array of topics, but maybe it doesn't get as deep. Um, and I think it's really cool that both of us are sort of doing this print thing at the same time. I think that says something about where the business model is headed as well. 
Interesting. Um, anyway, I have a lot to say about that, but I'm just really excited to be on this panel with Jane. Um, I feel very excited that we're both working on projects that are both sort of coming in this, from this like fringe, edgy place uh, to bring these ideas into the mainstream. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can't wait to, uh, to dive into it. I think uh, someone who's tackling, I guess, like similar um, like similar messages, but from a more uh, visual uh, perspective is Jake Harper. And we have him here, Jake, I'm going to uh, unmute you. And uh, he gave a fantastic uh, sanity preserver on like a, a really quite out there way in which we can improve our sense making um, and, uh, and all of the things uh, that, that we could use as an interface. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. But uh, Jake, and maybe you can uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, who you are and um, and, uh, and and how you think that you know your your tools can kind of like shape uh, can shape the, uh, the the narratives that we ought to be spreading in cooperative ways. Yeah, um, Alison, thank you so much for the intro and super stoked to be uh, talking with everyone today. Um, yeah, so uh, as Alison mentioned, um, most of my work has been in in the arts. Um, and I've been exhibiting mainly as a sound artist. Um, I guess to summarize, kind of my focus is around um, how people interact with complex information. Um, so, you know, a lot of my work deals with, for example, things like sirens or, um, uh, and it lately has kind of taken a, a, a move towards the applied arts. So working on like a human robot interaction and communication with autonomous vehicles and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, so I, I think one of the interesting things about, uh, actually I was looking up the word eucatastrophe, which is described in the, in the description of the, of the events. And I was really surprised to find that the word has a kind of literary roots. Uh, it was a word that was coined by J.R.R. Tolkien, um, which was, I was totally shocked to, to find out. Um, and it, there's a very beautiful uh, or definition of this word that I'd like to, to read. Uh, I think it might be a good way to kind of like set the tone. Um, because it's, it's interesting that the, the, one of the kind of rappers for this entire event, this word eucatastrophe, um, has its roots in the arts. Um, I think that's really powerful. So a eucatastrophe is an event that denies universal final defeat, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. Uh, and an interesting thing about the word joy, as opposed to words like happiness or sadness, is that joy is, is a expression that describes like it's like a vector like there's there's motion happening it's often why when people experience joy uh they cry right it's like this release of energy because something is moving um and so i just find for one or two there's no you know something maybe other people can talk about later um but um kind of moving back to the kind of the main topic um you know if you think about uh, you know storytelling um Essentially, storytelling is like this beautiful 50,000 plus year old technology for taking complex information, reducing the number of features in that information so that it be can become portable. Uh, so think, for example, if you look out your window and you see a beautiful sky and there's uh, streaks of red and green, there's a myriad of colors. It's a really uh, uh, kind of uh, variegated image that you're seeing. And when you, when you describe this to somebody, you don't uh, spend five minutes describing each color and each detail that you see. You, you might say something like, this guy was tempestuous last night. And suddenly you've done a feature, restrict, uh, feature reduction on the experience that you had in a way such that it can be highly portable and it's very efficient to communicate. Um, and so I think, you know, it's really interesting connecting some of the journalism that Lydia has been doing and with the Neo Life book uh, from Jane, this idea of uh, the value and power of collecting narratives um, towards transforming society, because this is essentially like a feature reduction on something that's really valuable and really complex. And by, uh, by reducing it in a specific, specific way through the, through the lens of the artist or through the lens of the editor or the writer, um, only through that can it become highly portable and then, uh, and then the information has efficacy, like it can be distributed. Um, so an interesting example of that actually, and then I'll uh, close and give it off to, to for Descartes to do his introduction, is um, there was a book written in the 18th century by a, a Scottish poet named James McPherson. Uh, the book was uh, it's called Tales of Fingal, or you know, the Epic of Fingal. There's a number of different ways of describing the title. Um, but the uh, interesting thing about this was, so purportedly he went around Scotland and did this kind of anthropological uh, uh, study to collect all of these Gaelic tales and then put them together in this, in this narrative that was supposed to be like the first. 
history of Scotland, uh, Scottish literature. And it turned out that actually he was just a brilliant poet and he wasn't super confident in his own poetic gifts. And he really was a lot more original than he, than he claimed it to be. Um, and this came out eventually. But this was like one of the seminal works that kind of brought the, uh, the ideals of, the romant of romantic literature to Europe, uh, spread it across Europe. Um, and in Tales of the Fingal, uh, there's a bard, an epic bard. And, you know, in, in literature of the time, everyone has kind of a, 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 a little phrase that denotes their function in the book. So, for example, if you're a soldier, you might be called, uh, like, you know, Alison, the daughter of steel. Uh, if you're a sailor, you might be Jane, the daughter of the wind. Like there's these phrases that kind of uh, poetically connect you to some concept related to your job. And for the bard, it was a very interesting and surprising phrase. And I think one of the most beautiful ways to describe the role of the artist in society, which is um, bards were described as the sons of other times. And, you know, this makes sense because bards are basically walking around battlefields, the heroes are dying, and their job is to remember all the heroes and then sing their, sing their praises for later generations, uh, which is actually a, quite a tragic job to have because, of course, it's impossible to, to fulfill that um, because memory, all things are forgotten to memory. However, um, what, how this relates to our discussion is if you focus on kind of a literal interpretation of the word other times, it doesn't mean necessarily past times, it just means times different to our own. And, and I find that an interesting, com combining that with the function of storytelling, of, of being a, a, a feature reduction in the number, uh, in the amount of information uh, in, a, in a kind of scene that you want to depict, it's also the role to, to place that information in some other times. And, th and through that, it becomes a kind of provocation. Um, so with those kinds of uh, thoughts, I want to take a step back and, and uh, let the introduction of the other panelists continue. Yeah, thank you. I mean, like, you know, one thing that kind of like, uh, when I started this existential hope project of like creating positive future visions, I was like, how, and that, that ties into what Jane and, and Lydia also said about transhumanism, like, how is it, for example, that most of the positive future visions are from back in the days, and they almost seem somewhat antiquated. And if you look at them, they're kind of like weird and awkward to look at, and you feel like they're those fragments. And like, if you start to look for that right now, there just hasn't really been a, a kind of like any update on that that would be enticing for the new generation, which is why I'm so stoked about those uh, projects that are that are popping up right now. And yeah, I definitely, in terms of like being a child of other times, you know, I just thought, wow, this is, that, that was really a time to be alive, you know, like imaginations were running high. And I think now with this crisis, there's definitely, you know, kind of like a, a really good uh, uh, inflection point to do the same again, right? If not now, when then? Uh, okay, uh, Dekai, uh, do you want to say a few words about yourself? And maybe um, you could already talk about, because, you know, that is one of your focuses on kind of the risks and promises that we have in this crisis. So in terms of like the narratives that could be emerging out of this, so that afterwards we can kind of like tackle them in specific ways. I think I muted uh, you, yes. Yes, <laughs> I, I was desperately trying to unmute myself, um, but it required your intervention. <laughs> um, the, uh, so I'm very happy to be here uh, and really like to hear about these perspectives from my uh, co-panelists. I'm coming at this from uh, a background, a multidisciplinary background. I'm an AI professor. Um, I work in natural language processing and machine learning, uh, and I alternate between Hong Kong, where I was a founding professor at the University of Science and Technology, and Berkeley, where I'm still at the International Computer Science Institute. Uh, normally, I ping pong every week between the two. Obviously, for the last four months with the coronavirus, I've stopped doing that. And so in my background, you see a representation of the university in Hong Kong where I teach. Um, uh, but I, I dearly miss the Bay Area. Uh, I would love to be there. And one of the things that uh, in my work uh, recently, um, where uh, I've been looking more at the problem. So, so the applications mm -hmm. of natural language processing that I worked on initially, where like if you guys know things like Google Translate or Microsoft Translate or such things, I pioneered those and built the first of those systems and developed a lot of the machine learning foundations. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been more recently looking at um, a deeper problem 
of how to get cultures to be able to relate to each other. It used to be, oh, how do we get you know, English speakers and Arabic speakers or Chinese speakers or whatever to, to understand each other. But I think that we have um, all realized in, in recent years that we are having a much more challenging problem of cultural um, um, divides and polarization where we relate to each other um, even domestically, despite the fact that everybody is speaking English. Um, and so we're, we're drilling much deeper now into the, into the problems of how the sorts of stories that we tell, the sorts of ways that we tell stories, um, the metaphors and analogies, the presentation, the visual languages and so forth, how they are actually um, uh, creating new existential risks uh, and in, in terms of tearing apart our societies and polarizing them. And this is happening both domestically and at a global level today with the increasing polarization. And um, at the same time, studying what we might be able to do to offer existential hope out of this um, situation. One of the things, one of the domains I've been looking at this problem recently, obviously, is what information disorder and polarization uh, has, has been happening in coronavirus times. Uh, and we've seen all sorts of, of information being propagated that is extremely polarizing and often is, is misinformation or disinformation. So, you know, like mask bearers are sick and contagious uh, or masks are unnecessary and they go against our individual rights and don't wear masks unless you're medical staff and um, you need N95 masks to protect yourself. Um, we saw, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, constant memes circulating about the coronavirus remaining uh, an Asian problem that we don't have to worry about. Um, that we still see now that the virus is some sort of escaped Chinese bioweapon or that it's some sort of escaped American bioweapon or it's the Chinese virus or, or that Chinese eat bats. Um, and uh, the, the list goes on and on. We've been studying this in our research. And the question is what to do when we have rampant misinformation, disinformation, and information because love in the time of coronavirus really is scarce. It's being replaced by irrationality, fear, and hatred, uh, and the pandemic's being um, paralleled by a panicdemic and an infodemic. So um, what we're looking at is the sort of underlying cognitive biases, the unconscious cognitive biases that um, AI-powered um, news media, social media, search engines, um, are continuing to propagate. Uh, and this is because of the pr enormous profits that they rake in by presenting people with things that exploit our, our built-in unconscious biases uh, that evolution have hardwired into us. And so they will exploit our overconfidence effect. They will exploit our pseudo-certainty effect, our ambiguity effect, the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, and uh, which you know, some of you may know, basically says that idiots think that they're geniuses and geniuses think they're idiots. Um, the um, bias blind spots. The, the thing is that advertising profit is maximized when AIs are preying upon our unconscious. And so uh, really our societies today are already comprised of both human members and artificial members of society. And the, and the artificial AIs outnumber the humans because for each one of you, you are shadowed by your Facebook AI, your Amazon AI, your Google AI, your Twitter AI, your Instagram AI, and your Apple AI and Microsoft AI and so forth. And all of these things are amplifying uh, the ideas, the memes and so forth that they're observing us working with and they're, they're mimicking what we do, and they're exponentially amplifying that back into society in a way that we've never faced before. Um, humanity has survived up until this point because the, there, there have been physical limits on how amplified our voices can be on things like that. And even when it got massively out of control, say World War II or the Cold War, it was still limited how much damage could be done, and those limits are gone today. Right, we, I, you know, like many of you grew up in and with the promise that internet was going to solve all of these things and, um, and democratize information. And what we're actually seeing empirically is that it's amplifying both the good and the bad. And a lot of our unconscious biases have, that have always caused society's problems are being um, amplified in nonlinear ways that we need to figure out how to get around and what sorts of 
what sorts of AIs can we now build that will help us compensate for things like our representativeness heuristic, which uh, causes us to make wrong predictions from the experience of similar events in the past like SARS or MERS or Ebola without realizing that we're overestimating the ability to predict accurately from that. How do we get AIs to help us um, with our weaknesses in, in feeding our present bias so that we're thinking about immediate payoffs instead of future trade-offs, about our empathy gaps, our confirmation biases? What about our defensive attribution biases where we, we tend to blame someone else at more more and more as the outcome becomes more and more severe. The framing biases, the reiteration biases, there are hundreds of these unconscious psychological biases that uh, we're um, facing an unprecedented challenge of tackling. And that's kind of where our work has been. And we've been really focusing in the last two months, working round the clock on one such uh, very important bias uh, which is a cultural bias in many areas outside of East Asia uh, against wearing of masks. Um, many places still today uh, are fighting this, even within uh, our own US uh, and many other countries as well. Um, it is not based on science, it is based on unconscious bias. And so that, you know, come, it's been very painful for me in Hong Kong to see that Hong Kong in early January already immediately everybody uh, um, became aware of the WHO warning, the Chinese, the Chinese um, warnings, and everybody voluntarily started wearing masks. 99% of the population out there wear masks when we walk around uh, with no laws requiring it. And as a result of that, plus social distancing and other um, measures, contact tracing, we've had now five days in a row straight with no new cases of coronavirus. We never hit an exponential curve. The vast majority of our cases in Hong Kong have been people returning from the US and Europe. Uh, how do we overcome these kinds of uh, unconscious biases in the future? Use, this is just one example, so that cultures will learn from each other instead of falling victim to our own cognitive biases. All right, thank you so much. I think that's a really good intro into okay, what are we up against? Um, you know, um, like just in case, you know, like I think, you know, kind of to set the stage for this, uh, you know, for this salon, like I was thinking, you know, that there really seems to be like two ways out of this, right? Like either the, the narrative could be something like, yeah, this was really t fucking terrible, but like, uh, you know, and it was really hard, we weren't up to speed but we kind of somehow managed to do it uh, and let's kind of like, let's continue, let's grow stronger. And it's like more like a global awakening of like, hey, it's the first call, the first time that like knowingly we all face the same threat, even though that's not technically true with climate change where people don't really seem to see that. So one way to go, you know, after this is like this kind of coming into BA moment. The other way to go is this totally, uh, the whole narrative gets digested into different echo chambers um you know like like you know in a few in a few weeks really and i think the time window is short you know everything will be totally politicized so i think there is this opportunity now at least to unite folks uh, locally via art and so for that you know i would love to um bring it up to the panel in a more concrete way of like what have you seen specifically in terms of narratives in terms of art created or in terms of specific projects right now that you think could be really empowering right now for people to kind of like lift their spirits and don't uh, kind of like shut down. Jane, do you want to tackle that first maybe? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> we have quite a few in our book, which I'll tell you about in a minute, but um, one of the most inspiring things to me are artists working with biology to create um, self-sustaining systems. Uh, and so there's this group out of London called Morphology, uh, which have done some beautiful work. There was a show at the, um, uh, the Pompidou Center last spring, um, which showcased all of that. Uh, it's, it's an astonishing collection of visions of how we can transition from industrial manufacturing to biological manufacturing. Uh, and there's so many examples of that that, um, that are in this particular show. But um, I also wanted to tell you about a couple of artists that we featured in the book. Um, one of them in particular um, is Heather Dewey Hagborg. And um, so you may know Heather from her, um, original uh, claim to fame, which was um, Stranger Visions. And so she had these um, portraits that she calls uh, portrait masks. And they were actually, um, she would pick up cigarette butts and, and 
pieces of hair and um, chewing gum, sequence the DNA, and then um, visualize the phenotype that could potentially match the genotype. When Chelsea Nanning um, agreed to work with her, uh, she did another one which was really interesting because it shows just how wildly different um, our DNA could manifest itself as. Uh, Chelsea could be a man or a woman, could be Asian, could be, you know, uh, all these different types of phenotypes. So that work is super interesting, but not what I wanted to focus on for this conversation. Her more recent work um, is uh, this piece, which uh, is called Love Sick, the Transfection. And, you know, she's basically working with um, uh, a, a molecular discovery company to do a custom antiviral um, whose uh, impact would be to uh, basically force a, an oxytocin release in the body. So you would take this ant, uh, retroviral drug and um, it would stimulate the release of the neurotransmitter oxytocin, which of course is what we get when we kiss or hug or um, breastfeed or, or touch. And I just, it's such a poetic thing. And of course she did this, whatever, six, eight months ago, um, you know, back before virus was, back when people were starting to think of viruses as ways to deliver, you know, targeted chemotherapies. Um, but just the idea that we could, um, you know, we could use these biotechnologies in a way to mitigate hate and fear and um, loneliness, uh, I think is really compelling. And, you know, it's, it's, Oftentimes, artists and journalists are accused of being negative um, because we ask questions and we put things out there that are, are designed to be provocations more than answers. Uh, and I think uh, in Heather's case, um, you know, she's done a lot of things to, um, I think, call attention to how biotechnologies can be used um, in, um, for instance, uh, profiling uh, by the police. Um, but I think if you looked at this example as something that, oh, it's, you know, we're all isolated from each other. Technology has driven us apart from each other. You know, now we have to take this virus, you know, to make ourselves uh, feel better. Um, you know, it, that's certainly one way of interpreting it. But to me, the, pops, the possibility of, um, of being able to, to address loneliness, uh, particularly when it's, you know, sort of, a, it's, it's causing pathology. I think is incredibly hopeful. Um, and, you know, just because a technology exists doesn't mean we should all use it all the time in ways that replace our natural interactions. Um, and so, yeah. anyway, I, I, I particularly like that example. Yeah, I dropped a couple of examples in Slack. One of them is one that I just saw recently called Fever Dreams. I put a link in Slack. It's like an, an, an anthology that was just composed in like the last few months by a group of science fiction writers. One thing I think is interesting about it is it's actually quite near term. The stories are based, I haven't read all of them, but the ones that I've read so far are all based in a time that's like months out or maybe a couple years out, not like decades out, which I thought was really interesting. Like they're explicitly trying to imagine are emerging from this specific time. So it's less of like a far future thing. Another book that I really, really like, which is actually much older, is a book called Doomsday Book, which I recently reread. It was written by Connie Willis, and it was published in 1992, actually. And it won the Hugo and the Nebula back then, which is a really big deal. It's like, it was a really big hit as a science fiction book. It was one of my favorite books as a teenager. And I've actually been working on a review of it from sort of the current coronavirus perspective. But it's a, it's a science fiction novel about pandemics. And when I was reading it as a teenager, I had never really thought about any of that, right? Like, and I think even for most of my adult life, I didn't really have something directly to compare it to in my actual life experience. Um, it's a time travel book, so it has, two, and it has two parallel storylines, one of which takes place in the past during a past pandemic, and one of which takes place in a future during like an imagined pandemic. And one thing that is so striking about this book, reading it now, is that the author, Connie Willis, who did five years of research before she published it predicted a flu pandemic like now like she predicted that one would happen sometime in the 2020s so remember she was writing in 1992 um 
And she imagines the future that follows from that in like the 2050s. So part of her vision, which is so striking, is she imagines a world where the governments and civil society actually have very concrete mechanisms for dealing with pandemics that are very fast. Like they have like rapid response mechanisms and some of them were, um, some of them are like, uh, just like quarantines, like really fast action quarantines. And some of them are biological. Like it imagines a world where literally humanity has figured out how to sequence viruses and manufacture vaccines in like weeks. And it's actually very subtle in the book. Like when I was a teenager, I don't think I even noticed that it was um, actually like way beyond current, <laughs> our current notion of what's possible. Um, but reading it now is really interesting. And it also does a really good job of getting at the psychology of living in a pandemic too. Anyway, I'm actually working on a, um, now that we've shipped uh, Numo issue one, I'm working on a sort of a from the present moment review of Doomsday Book. Um, I really recommend it. I'm going to publish that review soon, probably next few weeks. And I also recommend this uh, Fever Dreams anthology, which Allison just uh, dropped the link to in um, chat again. I, oh, and I yeah. guess another frame that I would like to mention, even though I haven't seen very many concrete instantiations of it, there's a frame that I really like, which I've largely seen in um, spiritual circles, but sometimes in ecology circles as well that sort of frames coronavirus as almost like a tough love intervention or like an ally to humanity, which is sort of just giving us a wake up call. I actually really like that framing. Um, I mean, it's, it can get a little bit close to this, like everything happens for a reason framing, which um, I think can be a little bit problematic in its own right. But I think that if it's possible for us to sort of think about what it would be like if we were actually sitting down with coronavirus as another being that was trying to tell us something. That's a really interesting way of looking at what's happening right now and potentially very generative. Yeah, I think Creon once uh, phrased it as like, it's like a parent that's beating a child. It's like a wake up slap. It's super uncomfortable, but it does this like incredible thing to you. And uh, it, like things will never be the same again afterwards, but it, it has this like, super weird wake up uh, wake up aspect to it uh, okay and uh, uh jake do you want to go yeah um so i wanted to call it two projects and then the second one i wanted to actually connect back to something that Kai had said but um first you know i think just from the point of view of, of things happening in the art world i've been really inspired by the uh proliferation of um kind of uh you know uh like casual live meetups, gallery previews of, you know, the gallerist doesn't have anyone able to come in and they put, to turn on uh, Instagram live and, you know, show, do a walkthrough for the 12 or 14 people who happen to, to click on it. What, the, what this kind of um, gets to is, is something that I think is really profound, which is that, you know, in some ways, the concept of like, who is an artist or who is designated by society to be able to speak for people with that platform, often is bound up in the privileges of space the, you know, I have real estate in this particular neighborhood and it's a very, uh, you know, fancy room. And so that gives me authority to say what art is or isn't. And I think what we're finding in this time is that the, this kind of like democratization of, of who gets to, to make these statements and who gets to organize communities and who gets to, to, um, to have like impact in that frame is, is suddenly just become totally obliterated and available to everyone. And actually there's somebody in the call here uh, named Jamila, um, a friend of mine who's joining a, a Foresight Institute event for the first time. But I think is a really great example of this where, you know, she uh, every week, every two weeks has these events on, on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, many people join in, their talent shows or things like this. And, and actually being able to recognize these for what they are, which are like profound art, art, artistic statements. Um, that, are, that we can all access and, and support and promote. So I, I think that's something that I've been really inspired by is just the um, the way that the world has kind of like, everyone has become a, a, a performance artist over these last two months. So it's been really inspiring. Um, the second thing I wanted Share, to mention. Share the link. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. I don't, I guess Jamila, you can uh, post a link in here if there, if there is one, but um, the, uh, the other uh, project that I wanted to mention, um, 
is a book that I've been reading by Jeffrey West, uh, who is a fellow at the Santa Fe Institute. And I'm like a lot of people who have been reading a lot of complexity sciences literature where it's kind of like somebody who recently took mushrooms for the first time. Like if you just poke me, everything that I wanna talk about is related to complexity sciences. Um, but what I think is really optimistic about this book is it kind of takes um, the idea that um, like biological life is all organized around very simple principles. Uh, and it extends not only from small organisms to large organisms, but also from small uh, social organizations like a startup to massive social organizations. Like, um, and why this is, why this is, uh, gives me hope is because, you know, Dekai was talking about a lot of the challenges around language uh, and how language can be incredibly polarizing. Um, and in some ways, you know, one of the ways that language operates, operates is that it creates in-group, out-group signifiers, right? So somebody uses a particular word and that, that word, there's many ways to carry a, a, a concept, but certain words signify you're belonging to a particular group versus other words. And so there's, a, there's this kind of like added emergence that comes from language where, where not only are we talking about information, but we're also actually just saying, I belong to you and you don't belong to me. Uh, you know, these kinds of statements. And so taking, kind of the perspective of, of some of the ideas in this book scale, as well as some of my own research. Um, you know, I, in my day job, I spend thousands of hours watching uh, videos of pedestrians and traffic and try to figure out ways to communicate to all of them in, in like very simple, simple means. And these are people who are tourists or who are uh, San Francisco residents or you know, residents of other cities. Um, and you would think there it really isn't like a common denominator that can connect people who have such diverse backgrounds and, and cultural uh, inclinations and uh, and frame uh, points of view, but but actually, like because human beings come from the same system that we all we are all defined by very simple rules. That that I I kind of am curious, and this is a question for Dakai, is that perhaps like uh, with language, one of the projects that could be of value uh, that I think somebody with a natural language processing background could could inform on is is perhaps we can devise a system for reducing the complexity of language. In other words, the language that we use for uh, public announcements, for sharing information, particularly in the news, um, there can be a lens for we're analyzing like how certain words actually increase the amount of polarization that a particular topic could could call could lead to versus ways of using language that that has less uh, in group out group uh, uh, kind of uh, tangle tangling crinkliness uh, maybe is a way to describe it um, and so with that that's a, a question I wanted to to open and the, to maybe give a concrete example if it's not clear would be like. You know, often um, when I'm reading the news, uh, it doesn't matter the source, whether it's New York Times or Fox or anything. I'm all, I often wonder, like, wow, this is a really beautiful literary description of an event. And I wonder if, like, you know, getting rid of all the adjectives or getting rid of uh, some words that, that make me feel good and know that they're speaking to my, to my subgroup, but just universalizing the, the message. Uh, maybe there's an analytical framework that can come out of AI or, or some of the tools to kind of you're working with that can actually help us um, talk about this more uh, quantitatively rather than uh, emotionally. Okay, thank you so much, Jake. I think I want to give it to you, Dekai, to, uh, to answer the question. Uh, I'm not sure you wanted to show a video, given the fact that we're now at 10 minutes and I want to give time for a participant Q&A. Maybe we can show the video at the end of this as a very like concrete effort. And uh, if you want to answer Jake's question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so very much so, the natural language processing work on this is actually um, uh, trying to go even even deeper than this because the problem is that simplifying language is almost impossible whenever you're talking about abstract ideas. 90% uh, of language is based on metaphor. Uh, and we're, we're incredible metaphor machines. We, we don't recognize that we're doing it. And the choice of which metaphor we use determines how we frame these issues conceptually. Some of you might know one of my longtime PhD mentors, George Lakoff. Uh, what we are doing um, is, is, is actually um, computationally operationalizing um, the kinds of insights that uh, George and other cognitive linguists have had uh, at scale. Um, it's, it's a repeat of the same thing we did to develop machine learning for translation, where we took a lot of the ideas that they had about how ideas are framed by language semantically. And we're pushing it now deep, 
deeper into how ideas are framed metaphorically, because that's actually where all the action is. Uh, we have a project called Unbiased that I uh, talked about on the Sanity Preserver, uh, where we are actually asking everyone out there to help us teach the machines to um, unbiased. And you can't really unbiased, but what you can do is you can help translate between biases. And that's what we're working on right now. Um, uh, mindful of the time, and um, as Allison said, um, I'd like to show you um, concretely what we did when we started identifying two months ago this problem of the, the bias preventing people from understanding the urgency of the need for not half the population, but 80 or 90 percent of the population minimum to wear masks to have any hope of slowing down the spread of the virus. And what we decided to do was not only to look at how we could re-language things and we produced with a team of five of us in Euro many European countries as well, glossy, uh, sorry you can't see this because of Zoom's um, fancy background thing, um, but uh, glossy uh, reports like this which are available on my site as well as um, uh, scientific uh, papers that are on archive uh, now that we just released. But we said, okay, the public is what we are. We really need to tell the story. How can we make use of creative media? How can we make use of online uh, interactive media to get to cut through the politicization and so forth? Uh, and so I'm going to show you what we released just a couple of days and has already gained thousands of views. Uh, it's being shared. It's being brought to the WHO. Uh, it's circulating in Harvard Medical School right now to rave reviews. And uh, many other things, and um, just want to give you an idea of how to how, how we're approaching telling that story. Uh, if you go to my website, you can do this later. It's just my name, uh, dek dot ai. Um, it's a name hack, um, and uh, it, I've redirected this uh, temporarily during the uh, COVID crisis to go straight to the masking project. But if you're if you want to, you can go down. Uh, there's a link at the bottom. Um, that actually goes to my, my actual bio homepage and stuff like that. But I don't want to talk about that right now. I want to show you this video uh, real quick and uh, you, you can watch it, but I've already brought this up on the screen. Um, oh, sorry, I need to share screen for this to work. Um, okay, uh, but um, Allison, you need to enable me to do this because it's host disabled participant. I think you should be share. able to now. I think uh, you should be able to now. And if anyone here has a question to the speakers afterwards, please use the raise the hand feature and uh, write me a private uh, write me a private note, and then we we'll take it afterwards. Awesome. Is this now showing on on, on your screens? Yeah. Just to make sure it's working. Yes. Okay. I'm just going to play the YouTube video, and we can talk about it. Uh, uh, you have to enable the sound also. Uh, uh, do you have the sound on? Yes, my my sound is on. Um, However, you, but I just allowed you to share the screen, so it should work. Okay, so we're going to try again. In light of global lockdowns, go. exponential okay. death rates, and a global recession, it's clear that measures need to be taken to curb the spread of COVID-19. Using sophisticated computational models, we've found that if the majority of people mask up by about day 50 of the outbreak, we can greatly curb the spread of the virus. If we wait much longer though, this opportunity will disappear. As of late April, day 50 for much of Europe and the Americas is immediate within the next few weeks. If at least 80 or 90 percent of the population wears masks by then, we'll not only be able to flatten the curve, we'll be able to significantly reduce the spread of the virus and return to life as normal sooner rather than later. To show how this works, we've developed an interactive computational model that anybody can use. Here's how it works. These lines represent how the disease may spread if no interventions are made. Blue is for healthy people who are susceptible to catching the virus. Orange is for people who have been exposed. Red is for people who are infected and infectious. And green is for people who've already recovered or passed away. By day 100 after the outbreak, a lot of the population has gone from susceptible to either infected, exposed, or recovered. And by the end of the timeline, most people have not only been infected and exposed, they've also recovered or passed away. These dots represent different people. In this run, there are 200 people. To begin with, 198 are healthy and two are infected. Now let's look at some parameters. The mask transmission rate is how effective your mask is at preventing droplets from your nose and mouth from reaching others. The mask absorption rate is how likely drops from the outside are to make it through your mask. 
While N95 masks are at least 95% effective, depending on the material, homemade masks are between 68 and 85% effective. Now, let's press play. As you can see, when an infected red dot hits a susceptible blue dot, it becomes orange or exposed, and then red or infected. This is reflected in the graph. The advantage of this kind of model is that it shows you how much variance there is in what can possibly happen. Each time you run it, even with the same parameters, it'll be a little different. And this is to account for random behavior. Maybe someone shakes hands with an infected person, for example, and then goes home to unknowingly infect the family, and maybe they don't. If you run the model many times, however, you'll find that it tends to average out. Now let's see what happens if the population starts wearing masks. Look at what happens to the curves. Even when the masks are only 70% effective, it's enough to significantly reduce the spread of the virus. This is super important as it buys time for the hospitals. The peak of the red curve is much lower, meaning hospitals will not be overloaded. It also helps buy time to develop treatments and vaccines. Let's try something else. This time, the population begins by not wearing masks. On day 50, though, 90% of people start wearing them. Now see what happens. Although more and more people were initially exposed, as soon as 90% of people mask up, the spread stops and starts to level out. This means that even if people only start wearing masks at day 50, it's not too late to significantly reduce the spread of the virus. Now let's see what happens if only half the population mask up at day 50. This might happen if mask wearing is only recommended and not enforced. As you can see, the virus is not nearly as well contained. Having just 50% of people wearing masks is not enough to prevent the virus from spreading at a high rate. Finally, let's see what happens if people don't start masking up until day 75. As you can see, at this point, it's too late to stop the rapid spread of the virus. This is why we recommend that by day 50, at least 80 or 90% of the population wear masks. Even if they're homemade, this model shows that it can still make a real difference. Once again, as of late April, Day 50 for much of Europe and the Americas is immediate, within the next few weeks. It's therefore important that people start masking up as soon as possible. Remember, by wearing a mask, you're not just protecting yourself, you're also protecting those around you. All right, thanks, so, Akai. So if you, if you um, uh, are interested to uh, try this for yourself, going... <laughs> Welcome back to the Late Show, uh, and please say oh, hello to our friend. That's the YouTube. <laughs> that was weird. You get that, um, you get that in the vlog as well. So um, if you're interested in playing with this yourself, so the idea was to use not just um, a visual medium, a visual language, but also uh, make this uh, in interactive media. If you go to my homepage, the next thing after the video, you can actually click on it and you can play with that simulator yourself and see what happens with the masking. Uh, there's also links to the white paper or the academic research paper and other uh, videos. Um, and in, in the questions that you asked um, for the panelists, one of the things that you were asking was, which you know, cooperative COVID-19 narratives and messages and memes are already created that we can signal boost. This is, this is uh, one case where we would really love uh, the foresight community's um, uh, assistance in signal boosting because we're rapidly reaching day 50 and uh, uh, we, we need for people to understand um, uh, the vast difference that it makes. All right, thank you so much. Definitely get on that. Um, I think we're now uh, at the end of the session. Um, thank you so much. Oops. Um, wow, this, this definitely passed much, much faster than, uh, than I expected. Um, I think what I would love and really, 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 really request of all of you guys to do is please check out the Google Doc. Uh, because one thing, you know, we've, we've already discussed a few projects that are amazing already and that we should definitely signal boost, but there may be other narratives. For example, why the Kai's project is cool, masks are something really specific. Masks are not only specific, but they also fight the more general cultural bias against people wearing masks, which then leads to kind of like rewire our brain into like reconsidering the biases that we formed before again um, for those same reasons so it's like a very actionable way so it's, it's kind of really neat but there's many other messages you know that we could already uh, kind of like predict uh, and then uh, doing that we, we could maybe already uh, do something uh, about them uh, and to kind of like prevent that they that, that they spread um and so please 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 fill out the google doc 
with that uh, said, I want to thank all of the uh, speakers uh, for today for joining. It's been really fantastic. Uh, I think a lot of you have answered questions in the chat. Uh, this is great. I want to encourage all of you, if you want to co continue the discussion, because we had so many amazing links sent, then please join the Slack group via the invitation link. Um, that's on the Google Doc. And there, I think we're going to just continue the discussion. I'm hoping that all the panelists will join to kind of like uh, uh, rope people in. And um, yeah, with that being said, I think we're at the end of the uh, of the um, of the official one. Uh, was, thank you so a, much. There was a great comment by one of the people that uh, said, "Could could you could we post the comment um, the chat thread uh, from these somewhere?" Because yeah, I, they're so great. Yes, yes. I'm even. I'm also working on Otter AI, which is like machine uh, learning uh, uh, based. Uh, transcripts of the Zooms that we then post in the YouTube video as we post the YouTube video so people can go into that uh, Zoom and then they can click on specific uh, speakers. Uh, and with that, we can also post the chat, um, you know, to uh, allow people to, to focus their mind a little bit better. But yeah, please collaborate uh, on the Google Doc. And I think we may share the chat on the Google Doc uh, um, or with you guys by the, uh, the Gmail group. Uh, that being said, thank you so, so much for joining. What we're going to do is we're going to stay on uh, for those who can still stay on. Um, but I just want to let the speakers go in case they need to. Um, I would love for you, all of you guys who are still interested in talking about this. Let's hear it from all of you participants. Um, uh, you've made so many amazing suggestions. I think Lou's going to take over. And um, uh, we have this uh, Google spreadsheet uh, which I think by now you all know, and maybe some of you have familiarized yourself already with the craziness that's on the spreadsheet. Uh, but the cool thing is that here um, in the contribution section, if you click on that uh, spreadsheet link, which I just shared, you can uh, type in your name, your email, but be mindful, the spreadsheet's on the internet, and there's a lot of people in that spreadsheet. Um, and you can uh, type in link to relevant work if you want. And all the way in column I, there's a bit of hope. It's a link to an idea, an art, a poem, a mosaic, people, and whatnot that um, we used to kind of like, uh, that we used to create a mosaic out of this. And I encourage you to do this, uh, fill it in now. Uh, and uh, I think I want to hand it over to Lou. Lou, are you here? Um, yes, yes, you are here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to unmute you. I'm muted. In case you didn't. In Okay. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, you didn't perfect. So while, <laughs> while people open up and fill it in, I'm going to say goodbye to folks. Thank you. It was really, really nice to see you again. And for everyone who wants to join tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., we have a check-in. So all participants want to contribute more and want to find out how to or want to get to know other participants. We're going to have a Zoom call at 11 a.m. again. It's on your Google Calendar if you've added it. And we're going to talk about how can you get the most of this workshop? How can you meet other participants? We're going to go into breakout rooms. And uh, what's your feedback to us so we can make this useful to you? With that being said, thanks to everyone. I'm off. Uh, and Lou, uh, the state is yours. Um, thank you, Alison. And of course, thank you also to um, all the contributors. This was really a mind blowing session. Um, and I think uh, the, the panelists had uh, actual serious competitions with uh, what was posted in the chat, which was totally insane. Um, and I think that's why uh, today what would be really cool, as Alison said, is to discuss these bits of hope. Uh, so I'm sharing a little the prompt in the chat, like what are they? Um, there might be an idea, some art, um, image, poem, music, maybe a, like video game, I don't know, uh, you know, anything that's, uh, that you would like to take into this new society, this new future. Um, that really gives you hope about long-term futures. Um, and uh, yeah, so today I think it was very much um, what, what our fantastic uh, panelists shared. Um, and there were things that were shared also by participants in the chat. But I think we also want this workshop to be um, a community thing. And so we want to see your faces. And so if you want to make some contributions, we would love to have you just share about these things. Uh, if people want to post in the chat, like we can call them out with Alison. Um, and or you can raise your hand um, using the raise your hand function and, um, and take the floor.
I think I really liked uh, the Ursula Le Guin uh, quote that uh, was posted about how we need artists uh, to create these visions in these hard times. And, um, and yeah, it was a fantastic quote. Um, so would anyone would like to step up right now um, or maybe share something that has been shared in the Slack? I think there was like the pseudo writer that was so good and um, yeah. I don't see any hands raised. Well, can we talk about uh, <clears throat> John Krasinski? Some good news. Is anybody watching him on YouTube? Yeah, PJ, great. Yeah, check it out. I just put a link um, to his YouTube channel. And uh, it's like in the format of Saturday Night Live, uh, only it's every day reporting on good news. It's so fantastic. And I think I read this morning <clears throat> that Pepsi has just made a $3 million donation through his channel. So major marketers are coming on board to kind of align themselves with these positive messages, which I think is so amazing and wonderful. I think he had a link. Oh, um, yeah, that's why it, it also reminds me of like, I think Wilma Gaskell once proposed this thing of a positive newspaper. You know, you, you usually never have uh, the things like in the news that are just going well. You know, right. you only have like the disaster. So again, like, again, you know, like hundreds of thousands of people lifted out of poverty, just like any other day. Right. Um, you know, a really good one to do as well. And I think, uh, you know, to, to do something, uh, what, we, what we came up with yesterday, actually, because now that we're talking about the uh, sharing, that may be cool to know is we did a Facebook event yesterday um, mm -hmm. that is basically a Dr. Lee Remembrance Day. It's on the day of his death next year, and it's to remember the whistleblower, Dr. Lee. Um, and I, I, I would welcome all of you to check out the Facebook event, share it with your friends. We would love to make this a global celebration day. Who is Dr. D? On the healthcare workers and all the general oh, laborers that, you know, Dr. Lee is the whistleblower of, uh, of who basically the first, who was the first one, uh, you know, to kind of like spread the news about uh, a, a SARS-like uh, virus with his community got shut down and then died of that virus. So we want to make that uh, a big kind of like uh, celebratory day. Please, please share the message if you can. Nice. It should be global. Okay, sorry, I don't want to take Lou, I think I'm seeing a hand raise from Mindy. Uh, yeah. yeah, I also see some uh, cool sharing. Uh, maybe there is Jerry who just shared something in the Slack, and I'm um, sorry, in the um, um, chat saying a bit of stunning music and visual. Uh, maybe Jerry wants to tell us what it is that we should check out. I can't unmute them, though, uh, Alison. Uh, okay, who is it? Jerry? Jerry? Sorry, can you repeat the name? Jerry, it's uh, G-E-R-R-Y. Okay, I'm muting him now. Hello there, can you hear me? Yes, Jerry. Yes, Hello. Hi. Well, I wasn't expecting this, and uh, it's just uh, well uh, being online and uh, uh, came across this uh, really interesting uh, list that someone put together on YouTube of uh, just some beautiful music, and it was titled I think Stay at Home, and uh, I, you know it's it's just one of the those lovely discoveries you you come across uh, sometime by chance, and uh, I just I just posted uh, a bit of music from there, so ho hopefully someone can enjoy that too. Okay, thank you so much for <laughs> thank you so much for thinking about our enjoyment. Um, everyone, you can check uh, this link in the chat. Uh, Christy, you have your hand raised, and uh, sorry, at least, and I can't seem to be able to. Oh, I unmuted yeah. Christy. Christy. You're on mute. Okay, thanks. Um, I have just one of these brainstorming sorts of things going on. I'm thinking about. I always think about when trying to promote change, I think about incentive and what motivates people to act differently. And it occurred to me that how you bring in a more positive dialogue is to get advertisers involved. 
because associating a product with a good feeling makes a lot more sense than, you know, all the, all the outrage marketing that happens right now is, is kind of, it, it could be flipped around and have a, like Coke did back in the 70s, have a Coke and a smile. Um, and, and they're not really uh, grasping onto that as well. Um, your comment about um, having a large um, philanthropic donation to um, the, the Good News YouTube channel, um, it, it, I think a lot more could be done with that. I, okay. Can I, may, may I? Um, yeah. May, may, um, um, so I, I think that these last couple of comments are really uh, on something. Like we, we have this issue uh, that we still are grappling with that um, our human unconscious biases are for evolutionary reasons naturally tilted toward um, um, fear. Uh, and that drives all the hatred and all the other uh, polarizing stuff. And, you know, it was for survival because in the old days, it, it, it didn't matter 99% of the time if you were wrong that, oh, that was not um, a, a tiger in the bushes that is about to eat me. Uh, you know, the, the one time you were right, it saved you. And the problem is that we're still applying those biases today. Okay. And advertisers and, and, and social media are taking advantage of that. And the outrage, fear things cause us to click uh, much more reliably and they derive advertising revenue from that. And so it really is a systems thinking problem that we need to be, be looking at here. How do we, you know, the, the philanthropic approach um, is, I, 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 it's wonderful, but I think there's an underlying um, systems problem that we, we, we need to like fix permanently instead of putting band-aids on it. Um, how, do we, how do we do that is something that um, I would love to join hands on. You know, we're working on the technological piece of the puzzle here where we can identify those things, um, but we need help um, you know, from an institutional, from a social level on how do we start integrating the, the sort of outputs that we can get from the machine learning into something that makes economic sense um, for, for companies and for advertisers. And so who, please, whoever is interested in this, um, get in touch with me and we're, we wanna put together a team to solve this. A as of 2016, I, I pushed everything off of my plate that I was working on um, uh, to, to really focus on this because um, this, is our, this is our society at stake. Mm. Thanks, Dikai, for the comment. I think uh, PG, PG uh, Manny had a reaction, maybe? You seem to have a burning... Um, I actually <laughs> have to jump. I'm afraid I have a call at 12.15, so I need to go or I'm going to be late. Uh, I did want to mention real quick on the Fever Dreams anthology that I mentioned, it was put together by, a, by someone who works in advertising. So I don't know that person personally, but I noticed when I was following them on Twitter um, that they work in advertising, so they might be worth talking to because they're clearly thinking about this in their off time. Um, yeah, there's a lot to say about advertising for sure. I think also supporting independent media, not to be too self-centered about it, but like it is definitely a thing to think about in a time like this. Um, anyway, I wish I could stay. I'm sorry, but I had to schedule this call at 12.15, so I uh, hope to talk to all of you at some point. <laughs> yeah, Ping said in chat, yes, independent media. Also, final note, Ping also has an interview in Numenality issue one about his work on the Ebola crisis. It is an awesome interview. I can't wait to publish it. Okay, I'll talk to you all soon, bye. <laughs> bye, Lydia. Thank you, Lydia. Bye, thank you so, so much. All right, PJ. Um, um, maybe Alison can unmute you and you can tell us what you wanted to say? Um, so related to Dakai oh, and everybody's work. Um, so super quick, I was chair of uh, World Transhumanist Association. I rebranded it to Humanity Plus. I've been in this space for a very long time. I'm a science fiction writer. Uh, we have a group called the New Mythos where we as science fiction and fantasy writers recognize 
that the only way we can actually change people's perceptions, their confirmation biases, their systems thinking, because here's the thing about science fiction writers and fantasy writers, we are actually both creatives and system thinkers. You can't world build without being a deep thinker of complexity. And so we're getting together to come up with, you know, what are our challenges? What are the biases our society has? What are the myths and metaphors we use unconsciously that make it very difficult to bring in a large number of people together who might agree with you if only they had a frame for it, if only they had a metaphor for it. And uh, so we're all together on Facebook. We're gonna try to build out and create a bigger site, but we're working with people to, um, I just got invited by MIT to go talk to them about how to frame this, uh, COVID. Um, so please join us there if you see yourselves as creatives in any sense who wanna start reframing Remythologizing, making new metaphors. Uh, so that's my offer, and I hope you'll have a great day. Great. Uh, I love like uh, calls for collaboration opportunities, and I hope there are like many that come out of the of this workshop, like independently of um, foresight. In fact, um, Brian Mujia, you had, I think, uh, some really cool bit of hope to share. Like a lot of people reacted positively to it and I, I've not heard about it. So I'd be excited to, to hear what it is. Um, Lisa, if you can unmute. Old and Brian, don't talk. Yes, hey. you're unmuted yeah. now. Okay, cool. Uh, so so uh, Midnight Gospel is this um, it's a, an adult themed cartoon TV show uh, on Netflix uh, created by um, an artist called Duncan Trussell and uh, Pendleton Ward, the creator of Adventure Time. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. So it, it's basically themed around a, a group of, uh, I guess, travelers, uh, people who are going across the universe, uh, simulating other universes and traveling to them and then harvesting technology from them. And then uh, in the process of doing so, interviewing people in those universes. And then uh, while doing that, the whole episode basically becomes uh, an, an extremely insightful podcast episode. So you're just hearing uh, a relaxed conversation about some very interesting uh, uh, topics, uh, very real discussions about uh, uh, human things like uh, addiction and uh, changes and adults dealing with uh, uh, radical differences in the world and dealing with other people and stuff like that. So it's very, very interesting and very insightful. I've learned a lot. Um, and it's, it's something that can, uh, I think, uh, it, it can sort of educate people about themselves in a way because they talk about a lot of very deep psychology and so it, the, the context is, it, it's not confrontational at all. And it's, it's, it's very subtle, it's really, really cool. It's a, it's a really interesting way to get people to think about these things. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons that I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, you get to think about them without having to delve through um, books and books and tomes of things. Um, so, uh, incidentally, I have, I have a question for, for Dekai about the, the, the cultural project. Um, so, the, is, is, the, is the process to here to, to figure out how to communicate better or to figure out how to collaborate better or to figure out how to include other people's uh, perspectives into the decisions made by algorithms? Uh, because for, for something that I um, I've been studying now for quite a while is uh, recommender systems, and uh, one of the issues that goes on with recommender systems is that they, they, they aggregate, and they aggregate maximally because of the the, the the mechanisms that are used to rank things. So, because things are ranked using something like maybe a softmax algorithm or something like that, then the the whatever signal gets identified as the positive one gets pushed to the max, uh, avoiding any other possible consequence. Um, uh, and, and, and I guess an intuitive example of this would be something like how uh, power law dynamics show up in any in industry. Like there's always going to be at least one or two companies that dominate the whole industry, even if there are thousands of companies participating. So something like that happens in machine learning systems uh, where like positive signal gets completely amplified even if it doesn't have anything to do with the general, general situation. So like is this a situation of, of because there are a lot of uh, algorithms that require labeled data 
and uh, because they're, they're trained on labeled data from the very beginning, they have no chance to aggregate a much more context that is important uh, because their signal, that signal gets eliminated once they're trained on labeled data from the very beginning. Does that make sense? Okay. It, um, yeah. it, it does, and I think, I I think the problem isn't so much uh, about labeled data or not because there's so much data right now. I think the problem right now is what is being maximized. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I actually, um, so I'm teaching, as it turns out, uh, this semester I'm teaching a new AI ethics course um, that the university um, asked me to, to put in eventually as a mandatory course after they discovered that Google had appointed me to its AI ethics council um, last year. Mm -hmm. I threw at the students this past week the challenge of, look, okay, uh, suppose that you are the AI for Google uh, to decide what is in the first 10 search hits, or you are the AI for Facebook or Twitter that is gonna decide what are, is in the first 10 or 20 um, items that the user is gonna see. Because for 99% of us, that's all we will ever see. Uh, we can sugarcoat it, but it's actually algorithmic censorship because uh, we all have a limited amount of time. We cannot see a billion choices. And there's an algorithm that is deciding the nearly one billion things that we are not seeing. Um, and so uh, given that, the ethical responsibility of the algorithm to decide what are the top 20 things that it's gonna show you is immense what should be in your ideal ethical system, the things that it chooses to show you? Should they all be things that confirm your pre-existing biases? Should they all be things that you're going to be clicking on? Uh, should they all, because that is what is being optimized right now. And if you think that is not the thing that we should optimize, that we should maximize, which is your likelihood of clicking on them, then, in that case, what are the ethical choices that you have to that that you have to make to change the objective function that you're maximizing away from that? And how do you justify those changes? It's a really challenging question, you know. That uh, uh, everybody was like, "Yeah, this is terrible," but that's when you actually assign that as a question, and people start struggling with it and start trying to come back with it answers, and they realize how difficult and ethical challenge that is because they're playing God here with what do you show instead if I take out five of those hits and I put in something else that is a huge uh, ethical choice and so what are the criteria I, we use for that Paul Paul has just put a really spot-on question in you know which is we can organize things to be uh, the most relevant or the latest or whatever across various platforms. What if we could dial it in ourselves, right? What if we could specify this is the kind of information that we would like? Give me 30% of the answers that confirm my biases, but give me 15% of the answers that throw me something uh, that's exactly opposite from what I think, because that's how we all get smarter. I listen to Fox News because otherwise I have no idea what they're even talking about. Right. right. And so, so I think maybe we should, we could try and uh, I, uh, uh, consider at least one perspective, right? Uh, so let's say the, the assumption that if, for instance, because I am uh, pu publicly written about all, all sorts of things relating to uh, machine learning and uh, um, to uh, especially ethical bias and stuff like that. So there is, there is a filter bubble of which I'm inside, right? So if I search, if I type for some things, then the ranks, the, the, the results will be ranked according to that perspective. But the thing is, that's not my bias, right? It's, it's not something, it's not mine. Like it's given to me, it's, it's, it's assigned to me by, by a ranking system whose preference ordering I have no access to, right? Um, like if, yeah, the, if, the, the problem here is that it's, that you know, it, 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 there's a saying, you know, um, uh, in computer science, it's, turtles all the way down. It's not only in computer science, <laughs> um, right? And, and the problem is that we, no matter how much we do that, we are still, in, in our choices of the dials, uh, we are still actually subject to the, the previous um, decisions that were made. Now, does it help to have the dials? Yeah, it does. But here's the challenge for us, again, when we look at it system-wide, is that those of us who would, you know, like, um, 
uh, like Jane definitely would, crank the dial up to 30%, uh, percent, um, are not as much of the problem society-wide. The, the problem is the 75% of the population that will not turn that dial. Uh, and so we have a chicken and egg problem. Uh, and we have to figure out how to, how to break that. Um, what is an ethical way of breaking that? Um, thank you, everyone. This is a fascinating discussion. I, I kind of want to uh, also give the floor to some people who have had their hands raised for a while since uh, we have three minutes left in this conversation. And I think Creon like, asked uh, a while ago if he could ask a question. So I'd like, um, uh, Alison, I'd like your help to unmute Creon so you can ask a question. Am I unmuted? Can people hear me? Yes, we you can. Are, we can hear. Hi, Creon. Yeah, hi, Jane. It's it's um it's I'm in a car on a long, long trip, as some people know. Uh, so forgive the audio and just cut me off if it becomes unintelligible. Um, so I wanted to just discuss two small matters: one which was early on with the science fiction, and one which was something that Jane said about the Good News Channel. I think it was Jane, um, and. So with, this, with, the, with the hope, people talk about we want hope, we want to write down in these spreadsheets visions of hope. I just want us to distinguish between uh, sort of, um, how can I say it, like wimpy hope. Wimpy hope is that we're going to all mask up and find vaccines and, you know, get, get this over with, right? I think that we should probably, you know, that's just, that's kind of like, utilitarian stuff and it's all fine but i really think we need to concentrate on hope like big hope like leveraging you know the crisis and and changing the world so that you know when we come out of it it's not just almost as good as it was before we went into it but it's it could be way better so i just want to put a plug out there for let's classify these kinds of hope as hope that we make it through the pandemic and hope that we come out uh eventually in a much um more advantageous uh, robust compassionate state, whatever adjectives you want to apply. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is kind of minor, but I want to say that it's sort of a dark thing. It's like Pepsi gave $2 million to somebody's good news channel. Well, Pepsi should fucking be shut down because they're the ones who pushed sugar water on the entire developed world and made them so metabolically sick that this virus is even a problem. And that's just an example of the kind of thing that's going on it's beyond regulatory capture which all of us good libertarians are you know upset about and you know all sorts of other people are too rightfully but there is a kind of institutional capture that has happened where where these these companies that are just optimizing for terrible things when it comes down to the the health and well-being of humanity uh, are you know they spend they spend two two million dollars is that they spend every day on advertising, every one of these companies. So just let's be careful and not um, and not fall for the hype when these truly awful organizations. And I don't mean that the people who make them up are awful. I mean that you know because of um, perverse incentives and sort of self-organized uh, rogue problems, they are wrecking things and they need to be held accountable. And I'm sorry, they should be giving $2 trillion to clean up their mess, not $2 million. Well, I don't disagree with that at all, um, but you know, there is good and evil in the universe and even an evil corporation can do good things. And if their money supports, you know, <laughs> Desmond Tutu, this whole thing about, you know, your money is tainted, I won't take it, um, is, is a really, um, principled stance to take, but I, I, I'm not, I, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm not advocating that the guy doesn't take their money or that they don't give the money. I'm just advocating that we see clearly the balance sheet of what they do that's good versus what they do that's evil. And that's just one example. I don't mean to pick right. on PepsiCo. You know, there's a hundred companies like that. Right, exactly. Um, and as Desmond right. says, once you give me money, it has been blessed. <laughs> once money passes my hands, it has been blessed. <laughs> that's nice. All right. Thank you. And All right. Well, thanks, Creon. Um, again, what a 
fantastic uh, session we had today and we really did uh, end up this crazy week uh, with a bang. Uh, I, I, so I think um, to wrap up this session, uh, maybe Alison, do you want to say something about uh, the, the sort of uh, check-in tomorrow? Yeah, I'm currently vicariously trying to transport everything from the chat in its boxes on the Google Doc so that others who are not in this uh, conversation can add their own pieces again for the report in the end. But hey, I just I just want to like uh, second the thank you, Jane. It was fantastic to meet you. I'm really, really, really flattered that you came on and made time. Uh, Dekai, likewise, it's always really nice. And we definitely very much miss you in the Bay. Um, I don't know if Jake and Lydia are still on. I think they had to drop off, but I loved this session. It was fantastic and like, Please keep so much participation going in the next week. It will be amazing. Uh, if you want to contribute more and if you want to find out exactly what we're hoping to do with all of your contributions and how you can plug in tomorrow at 11 a.m. and it's in the Google calendar if you have it added. We're going to do a check-in and, you know, forever, for, for anyone who, A, wants to get to know other people in this group, uh, B, wants to kind of give us feedback and help us help you better. And C wants to know like what are specific things that you could already be doing um, uh, in, in plugging in. That's the session for you. With that being said, I wish you a lovely Friday and I see many of you next week or tomorrow. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>